What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House. And I'm now joined by Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert, hosts of The Orange Pill. How are you two doing? Good. We're super happy. Looks like a good year for commodities. It does. It does. Yeah, I know your theme for this year. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's relentless optimism. We are relentlessly optimistic because we are in the Bitcoin community and it's hard not to be relentlessly optimistic. As Paul Tudor Jones, legendary hedge fund investor, says about the Bitcoin community, it is a bet on human ingenuity. Yeah, I love that. Okay, I want to dive into that philosophically later here. For anybody who's not super familiar with what you do and, and what you talk about on the orange pill, could we open up just maybe with like a 30 second commercial on what people could expect if they tune into the orange pill? Orange pill podcast is relentlessly optimistic about the future. This is once you've taken the red pill, you see the fabric of the political, geopolitical, economic and financial systems as it is, then what comes next? And that is, we believe the orange pill. And it's a relentlessly optimistic one if you choose to realize what Bitcoin has delivered is individual sovereignty back to the individual, back to the human individuals. We also have a situation where we, the individual Bitcoiners, the people who invented and made Bitcoin. Well, we did something that has not been done in 5,000 years. We separated the state from money. And that is an amazingly powerful thing. If you realize the power we have, you can only be optimistic. No, I, I like that. And, and what I want to mention at this point is because a lot of a lot of my viewers that watch this content, they come from the precious metal space. And there's, you know, there's not as much resistance as there used to be uh, towards Bitcoin. I think if I were to dial it back two years, there was a bit of a binary outlook. You had to choose one or the other for some reason. And, you know, I never saw it that way. I, I invest in gold, but I'm not a gold bug. I invest in Bitcoin, but I don't I don't know if I'm a Bitcoin bug. Um, I see value in both and utility in both in my portfolio. To your comment there, Stacey, about the disconnect for the first time in 5,000 years between state and money, if I got that right. Um, so I think we can see that. My question to follow that up would be, what could what could compromise that? And is there a situation that you see that could, that could uh, I guess, the state get its fingers involved in Bitcoin and we see more capital controls, et cetera? Uh, no, I don't think uh, that's uh, really going to be the case because the, as was talked about, Bitcoin separates state from money and the state has no ability to get into Bitcoin or disrupt Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is unconfiscatable, it's uncensorable, and it's going to um, really disintermediate the state. I, I think we're going to see now the beginning of the dissolution of this nation state as a model. We're going to see one of the major central banks go under in 2021. I think the central bank model is going to also uh, go the way of the uh, horse and buggy. And um, so they don't really have any way to attack Bitcoin. There, There's a couple of ways, theoretically, that Bitcoin could be challenged. One would be to try to control the network in some way. But no state or group of states have the computational ability at this point to attack Bitcoin that's running at 150 um, quintillion calculations per second. There's simply no system in, in, in the world that's anywhere near this. And um, there's another factor here, which is, I think, plays into this idea that gold bugs have where Bitcoin, where gold is physical and I can hold it and Bitcoin is not. And so, th therefore, I, I can't really accept it. Well, sure. One thing to keep in mind is with that, with Bitcoin, there is, you could say, a physical element to it because the encrypted shield that keeps the Bitcoin community um, uh, separated from the state is uh, impenetrable. The, it, you're essentially, when you're in the Bitcoin network, when we're transacting a Bitcoin and we don't need permission, we don't need a bank, mm -hmm. we don't need an intermediary, we can transact. Any two individuals on planet Earth can transact without any interruption. No state, no bank. 
And uh, there's no ability by any outside force to stop that because the encrypted shield that protects the network is impenetrable for the, what I just mentioned. So in that, in, to that degree, it's, it's physical in that sense, if, if you can think of it in terms of it has a physical attribute, it's just as a brick wall would be, a, you could not w run through a brick wall. You know, there's the physical yeah, uh, object you. in your way. You cannot penetrate or pierce the encrypted shield that keeps the Bitcoin network free from the state. So right. that's like a, a wall, so you can't break it. So I think gold bugs, if they have that, if they think about it in those terms, they can migrate over from gold and start to see Bitcoin and understand the Bitcoin use case and the Bitcoin value proposition. And you get more of the gold crowd into uh, Bitcoin. I agree. And thanks for that. And so, and, and yeah, the, the tangible element, you know, doesn't bother me so much or never really has, I guess, because, um, you know, we're a technology driven species at this point. And you can look at a 5,000 year history relying on an asset, but so much has changed in the last hundred years that we could, you know, it's, it's, I don't know how relevant it is anymore. You, you know, so I, I want to follow up with a question there and I guess, keep in mind that my, my, my understanding of Bitcoin, I would call juvenile, right? I, I dollar cost average into Bitcoin and, and Ethereum pretty much. And then I, I you know, play in the, in the capital markets opportunities a little bit as a wealth creation uh, exercise, companies that are leveraged to the crypto price. When I ask about the state and Bitcoin, I guess where my mind is at and explain to me how this is wrong is not so much that the state gets involved in Bitcoin, but the state shifts to those who hold the most Bitcoin. You know, if we're talking about a finite uh, number of coins and there's a small population of people that I mean, like yourself, that were you were a decade ago talking about why this had utility and why people should pay attention and, and started building a, an allocation. My next door neighbor isn't going to turn his head until the price is 100,000, 150,000. And then he's purchasing the same asset at a vastly inflated price. We'll never have anywhere close to the quantity. And so would we would could we end up with a very small population that controls 90 percent of the value? And that essentially becomes the state in some way. Well, I think the state, you see, there's a game theory layer baked into the Bitcoin protocol. And we want the states to try to get involved. And we want the sovereign wealth funds. And we want the hedge funds. And we want the Michael Saylors. And we want the private corporations. And we want the balance sheets. And we want Elon Musk. And we want Jeff Bezos. Because uh, the more people come into Bitcoin, the hash rate goes up, the security goes up, and the price goes up. So uh, we want everybody in the world, every government, every sovereign wealth fund, every money manager, every household to buy Bitcoin uh, and to enjoy the price appreciation going forward. Um, you do have now that transitionary period that will come from Bitcoin as a store of value where it is now to becoming a medium of exchange. And that's happening quite rapidly. And I think it, it'll start to push aside other payment rails in the next couple of years to unit of account. So we are heading to a world that things are priced in Bitcoin. And so any amount of Bitcoin will be needed if you want to participate in the global economy. I right. would follow up. I would follow up with that. And I would say that a few things. First of all, regarding your previous question to Max, is that when you separate a state from money. The previous moment, revolutionary moment like that was when we separated church from state. And that was something br that also broke thousands of years of human behavior. There were these divine people that God himself appointed to lead over us, rule over us. And something snapped that we attacked these people, beheaded them in France, and just like, that is a huge break that you can never go back. France will never have a king again because they've already beheaded it because they've already said there is no divine individual. We're all, we all have human rights. We all have, you know, have the same natural law applied to us. Well, the same thing happens when we broke this connection between money and state. Now, I think Originally, like when we first started using gold as money, there was no centralizing state around money. And I think it slowly happened because humans didn't understand what they had with gold for thousands of years. The, the age of Medici was the, uh, an amazing period of time when 
you know, the state had to come to the Medici's. They had to come to the people who, with gold and beg them to finance their wars. Mm -hmm. And then after, soon after the age of Medici, the Renaissance, then the state started with the Bank of Amsterdam to start grabbing people's gold, convincing them. They didn't steal it at first. They just convinced them to give it to them and they would give them these bonds or, de or credit instead. But that was a mistake. And now we have Bitcoin. So we, we can move on from that. Now, in terms of power, there, there is no central authority in Bitcoin. Even the whales, who even those people with lots of Bitcoin. We proved that in 2017 with the fork wars. The, 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 the giants, the whales, the corporations, the powerful, you would think powerful individuals in Bitcoin tried to fork it, hard fork Bitcoin to, uh, you know, something that the users, the little minnows of Bitcoin did not want. And the minnows won because they were more than, you know, just mm. even by having like a fraction of a Bitcoin versus the guys with tens of thousands of Bitcoin. There was nothing that you, they could do because of the amount of users all around the world that decided they didn't want what the whales wanted. Right, plus as you move into an era of Bitcoin as a unit of account, those, those holding large amounts of Bitcoin will start to circulate those Bitcoin because everything will be priced in Bitcoin. <clears throat> so if I wanna buy an 85 foot Hatteras yacht, I'm gonna be paying Bitcoin. That means I'm disgorging some of my Bitcoin and yeah. the Hatteras yacht maker is now taking Bitcoin. So that's the transition of money. It goes from a, uh, you know, store of value, or first it's a collectible, then a store of value, then a medium of exchange, then unit of account. And when we get to unit of account, you're going to see that circulation. And that's that we're already transitioning from store of value to medium of exchange. That's what's happening now. And uh, during the very early years, it was a collectible. You had the cypherpunks were storing it on their computers as a hobby, as one might be a stamp collector. Yeah. And it became yeah. a store of value. And people like Michael Saylor and Paul Tudor Joe's get involved. Yeah. Then it becomes a medium of exchange with second layer on the transaction side and payment trail on built on top of the Bitcoin protocol. And then it'll be go to unit of account. And we're in a Bitcoin only world. Everything will be priced in Bitcoin. So you, you mentioned Saylor a couple of times and, and that news event was, it seemed to me is to be such a catalyst. So talking about the significance for anyone who's not familiar, Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategies made Max, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the, the first significant bet from a corporate treasury into the Bitcoin market. Probably not, but the first one that caught headlines from what I saw anyways. Right. So Michael Saylor, you know, he first looked at Bitcoin in 2013 and uh, he was a skeptic. Then the what Stacey's talking about there, the block size wars of 2017 convinced him that of the robustness of this technology and the invincibility of this technology. And then he did the deep dive. And he is a rocket scientist and runs a technology company. So, you know, he yeah. knows how to do his due diligence. And after a couple of years, he emerged as this huge buyer on MicroStrategy's balance sheet. And his use case is that it's a reserve that, unlike the dollar, is not losing 20% due to inflation every year. And um, so that's what drove him to put it on his balance sheet. And at the time, my thought was that this is remarkable because everybody else in corporate America was looking at that money printing from the Fed and saying, hey, why don't we use that cheap money to buy back our own stock? Right. And we've seen this all over corporate America, right, from Apple Computer, the biggest of the companies, all the way down, executives use that cheap money from the fed they buy back their own stock their stock options or executive stock options go up by thousands of percentage points and they're making lots and lots of money so michael saylor could have done that but michael saylor is saying you know what i'm going to actually i'm going to go against the fed i'm going to attack the fed i'm going to make a i'm going to go against the fed and i'm going to borrow that cheap money and he did a subsequent offering where he did in fact float uh a, a uh, some debt for um three quarters of a percentage point and he bought some more Bitcoin and he's saying, look, I'm going to take that cheap money and I'm going to buy Bitcoin. It is in a lot of ways and in my view, and I haven't seen a lot of people follow up on this, but in my view, it's very similar to what we saw with George Soros in 1992 in the speculative attack against the Bank of England, where he realized that there was a total mispricing as Bank of England and the euro, the exchange rate mechanism 
uh, was such that, and Stan Druckenmiller was working for him at the time, they could attack the Bank of England, essentially, and they made a billion dollars in a week, I believe, if memory serves, by um, exploiting this enormous gap in the marketplace. So sailors saying, wait a minute, these rates at under 1% are artificial. They're there only for one purpose, to bail out the insolvent banking industry. I'm going to take that money and I'm going to actually attack the system by buying Bitcoin. And he's already made over a billion and a half dollars doing this. So any other corporate CEO in America has got to look at this. And many have now. You've got at least 20 uh, followed suit. Uh, and then mm -hmm. Paul Tudor Jones made it safe for the hedge fund industry. Now you've got yeah. all kinds of hedge funds involved. Right. And you've got a Mass Mutual is an insurance company. They're buying it now. So now it's safe for the insurance industry to buy it. And um, you already have individuals buying it and you have high net worth individuals buying it. And so we still have the sovereign wealth funds to get involved and the state treasuries, the central banks at some point will get involved if they're not already involved. Right. Right. And so so when you talk about sailors bet, you know, on Bitcoin, it's kind of a bet against central banks. And that leads to your thesis of 2021 being the year that did you say all central banks or central banks begin to fail? Um, what what will we look for, Max, to see that prediction coming true? What else could we? Right. So we already they're already um, putting the 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 rhetoric out there, right? They, they're talking about a reset. Yeah. Or a new Brenton Woods. Yes. So what will happen is they'll get they'll get together and they'll say, OK, the European Central Bank needs to be completely recapitalized in with a special drawing right or something else. And that essentially is a failure. Remember when the uh, United States defaulted on its gold obligations to Great to, to England in 1971? <clears throat> they branded it as uh, not as a U.S. defaulting on a, on its foreign obligations. That wasn't how that was branded. It, Nixon simply said, "We're going to close the gold window." Uh, right, but it, what it was, it was a default. Right. So here, I think of them all the major central banks, I think the ECB is the weakest, and I think it's the most prone to bureaucratic kind of maneuvering in this way. And I see them essentially having to uh, reset the ECB in, in some way and, 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 and therefore kind of uh, re-architect, do, do like a Brenton Woods too. But okay. it'll, it, they won't call it a failure of the ECB, like a central bank failure. That's not what they'll call it. They'll, re, they'll brand it something differently. But that, that's what it'll be. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, as we know, is leveraged, I think, 70 to 1. So it's, it's, it's technically bankrupt already. And um, it's insolvent to this. It, it's already insolvent. There's nothing there. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how the U.S. responds. I think the U.S. has a particularly bad hand in this global poker game coming up so we'll see how that plays out but that that's that's what i mean when i say that so so help me wrap my mind around something uh when it comes to just investing more in bitcoin now because every instinct i have as an investor when you see a chart that looks like this you want to run away from it right uh that's historically and when i see the sentiment surrounding bitcoin on twitter or in various chat groups or conferences or whatnot it's very reminiscent of the sentiment around gold and silver in 2011 when um you know the bulls had been proven right year after year and you couldn't tell them any different that silver wouldn't go to a hundred dollars and it was a lot of frustrating conversations and binary predictions um i look at the bitcoin price today and i think anybody who entered the space even just a year ago is up 400 percent the speculator in me says people are going to start taking profits and i understand the bigger picture moving towards a unit of accounts but you know we still operate on a U.S. dollar reserve currency. So do you, do you expect that to impact the trajectory in 2021 here? Just looking at the profits that are on the table that are very tempting for individuals. Right. Well, we started buying it at a dollar. Yeah. So uh, that question has been around for 10 years, right? Uh, when it was at a dollar and then trading at $50, uh, you're like, wow, it's, you know, it's a 50x return. That chart looks pretty uh, parabolic. Uh, same thing at five hundred dollars and a thousand and ten thousand, and now we're up around you know pushing high thirty thousands, forty thousands. But I think what people need to understand about Bitcoin is that it is the birth of an entirely new asset class, and it's on its own vector, and it doesn't correlate with anything. 
and it's disrupting the entire global money system and disrupting gold and gold as we know is in the what 10 to trillion dollar market cap level and bitcoin should trade uh at an even market capitalization to gold so we're talking 400,000 plus per coin and that's still a, a huge return from the current high 30,000s to 40,000 that's number one number two there's just not a lot of supply uh the bitcoins on the supply side is very meager and the protocol is ingeniously designed so that every four years the output or the supply is cut in half you know you have the halvings every four years we just went we just experienced one recently in the last six months or so and um that of course gets people's attention because that supply is shrinking unlike the gold market where the supply is, you know, call it two and a half, three percent a year. And if the gold price were to get to $5,000 an ounce, you know that the supply would go a lot higher because suddenly technology would improve, people would uh, do more exploration, they would find more deposits. And just like we saw in the oil industry, remember the idea of peak oil and oil was at $147 a barrel. Oh my gosh, well, then here's fracking. You know, they the technology closed the gap and suddenly there was a supply glut of oil and uh, the price got very, very weak. And the same thing can happen in the gold market. Uh, whereas uh, that's impossible with Bitcoin. It's algorithmically deterministic at 21 million coins. That's it. The supply on a daily basis, we're currently at 900 coins a day, is constantly shrinking every four years as per the halving. And, and that gets, so the, the supply side of the equation is getting smaller and smaller and the demand side is getting stronger and stronger you know i mean if you were to plant an acorn into the ground and uh, you come back the year later and it's uh you know a foot high or 18 inches high you'd be like wow you know this is an amazing return on my acorn they come back 10 15 years later and it's uh you know 50 50 feet high 60 feet high right i mean this is the seed of a new asset class mm -hmm. that is on a vector that is unlike anything else we've ever seen separating state from money never happened before and the need is going hyperbolic up because states are collapsing look at the chaos in america and all over the world money printing parabolic i mean look at the money printing that's going on 30 percent of all money in america printing i think in the last uh four years or something like that and just an amazing amount of paper out there and uh, the ability to transact online is instantaneous anybody with a telephone can buy bitcoin money managers have no problem getting huge amounts of cheap money they can buy bitcoin so that's why you know you gotta think of it like um uh you know we we've seen i think apple can apple stock adjusted for splits is if you were to uh go back and and reverse all the splits it's trading for around thirty thousand per share okay and uh so bitcoin at thirty thousand a coin right i mean when you combine gold with a messaging app you have <laughs> this phenomenon and it's not good it's not going in it's not going to get shrink it's only going to expand exponentially it's exponentially expanding I also want to point out that Paul Tudor Jones, when Bitcoin was at 16,000, said it was mispriced. So it, if it's a mispriced asset, I mean, and, you know, he's a, a alpha hedge fund manager. People right. follow where he goes. And I think he actually led a lot of all these hedge funds piling in. You know, they're piling in because of Paul Tudor Jones. So they're looking at it and studying it and deciding, yeah, if that's a mispriced asset, and if they believe, as JP Morgan has said, it's 146,000, Bank of America says it should be 318,000 by December of 2021, uh, BlackRock, like all these people are coming out with these uh, numbers that are in the six digit numbers, and all these hedge funds are like, I don't care if it's um, if I overpay at 40,000, because I'm gonna grab it, because I know it's going to 200,000. So like, is if it's mispriced, it's hard to, you know, if it, if it has to go parabolic to get to the right price and then start leveling off and, and trading around there. Yeah, exactly. So it has to, it has to reach some stasis or equilibrium price where it can flips over to unit of account. And right. that's, I think, got to be, it's got to be a lot closer to the valuation of gold 
So that's a 20, 30, 40 X from here. You right. know, the other thing is people say, well, it seems like it's a high price and I, maybe I should sell it. Remember, there's never only one decision when you sell something. There's always two decisions because after you sell something, you have to buy something. Yeah. Right? If even if you go back into cash, so sure. are, the yeah. question is, okay, am I going to sell my Bitcoin and sit in fiat money? <laughs> you know, that would be something even Dr. Kevorkian, the suicide doctor wouldn't recommend something as stupid as that. So then what are you going to do? You're going to buy uh, the stock market You're going to buy Tesla stock at a thousand times earnings. Yeah. You're going to buy the bond market at a 300 year top, a 300 year high for the bond market. Is that where you're going to park your funds at, with negative interest rates? Right. Right. So where are you going to, where are you going to sell your Bitcoin and go where exactly? And do, you know, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, other than, I guess, some hard assets and whatnot. But so uh, my question for you then is, is what could prove that wrong? Just to, to play devil's advocate, anything in your periphery, your outlook, what could, what could change your opinion? If there was some policy change or, or historic event, um, is, is there anything on the radar, Stacey, Max, that would change your, your outlook? The American people decided to <laughs> nominate for president two options, a, a clown or a man with cognitive decline. You know, it's it, it's like they kind of made their decision. Like we have a guy who's 80 years old in office who started exactly, he was elected the month that, uh, a, a month or two after the US went off the gold standard. And I think we've kind of given up. I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything a Joe Biden administration can do to rescue the dollar. And the dollar is all that matters, right? It, it, that's all that matters in the current paradigm. China's doing their own thing. They're stockpiling gold. They're probably stockpiling Bitcoin. I know they seized 200,000 from a, a Ponzi scheme operator, 200,000 Bitcoin. Who knows what they're gonna do with that? But right. but they they're stockpiling, resources we have no idea like all those imports over the past decade how much they're actually stockpiling sure. in preparation for this thucydides trap situation and the dollar collapse i think they've been preparing for it if you look at their actions that's what i'm assuming so w like this system because the world is under a u.s empire it's up to the US. Only the US could fix the situation because they're the ones in charge. But like Warren Buffett had said with the derivatives, like where do they even begin? <laughs> There's so much fraud and derivatives and, and, and debt and, and nobody knows who owns what. And, we, you know, so this country, we can't even distribute a vaccine. We can't even, we don't even make masks. Like we're sitting at home for 10 months printing up like, hundreds of years worth of currency because we don't know how to make a mask and nobody apparently knows how to make a mask in this country a face mask a medical mask yeah. so i mean what do you think that that sort of country <laughs> can fix the system that they created i mean no, how, I, 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 how, how difficult would it have been to just simply refabricate the treasury to print masks <laughs> instead of dollars <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm totally with you on that. I know, Stacey, in answer to that question, I absolutely do not see any sort of competent leadership that's going to create a plan that, you know, would change the course of history as it's unfolding. I guess my question was more based in what's, you know, what, what unforeseen events could occur. In right. Okay. So it, it, it's like a question of probability and risk, right? Sure. So money management is both you've got um looking at upside and alpha you know but you, it's a risk adjusted right you've got to adjust for risk so in the case of the fiat money avalanche think of it like um niagara falls right there's a there's a there's a niagara falls of cash that's coming into the system and you're in a barrel and you're heading for the edge of the falls and you get to the point where we are now in America, where the barrel has now gone over the edge and it's now falling down the Niagara Falls and it's going to head for the rocks. So the question is, what could stop the barrel from falling and hitting the rocks below? And the answer isn't um, absolutely zero because, for example, a flash uh, freeze right. could happen sure. and freeze Niagara Falls yeah. and stop the barrel. A helicopter could come and you could extricate yourself from that barrel and you could avoid death. Okay. Sure. What is the probability of that? 
It's not I would bad. say it's not absolute zero, but it's close. Yeah. So I say, okay, what's the probability that the Niagara Falls of cash, which is destroying the American economy and the global economy, um, and we've got Bitcoin, which is now on a parabolic move, people escaping the, f the blazing fire that is the fiat money bonfire of nuts running the system. What is the probability of that changing and going in reverse? And the, I would say if it's not absolute zero, because you never know, aliens could show up like Paul Krugman believes in aliens coming into America. The Galactic Federation. The Galactic Federation <laughs> could show up. You, uh, Area 51 could it could send over some some aliens and things. You know, you can't say it's absolutely zero. But right. I think it's as close to zero as you ever find in the money management business. You know, with Bitcoin, I say there is no top because there, when it comes to the dollar, there is no bottom. And also, you're going on 300 years of history. No, no fiat money has ever survived, right? They've mm -hmm. all gone to zero or lost 99.9% .9 of their purchasing power. So, you know, that seems like I've never seen a, a, a more lopsided, one-sided bet in the 40 years that I've been involved with Wall Street investing, investing technology, startups as a CEO, and I've done everything from in this business you could possibly imagine. I've never seen a more lopsided upside bias than I have with Bitcoin. I might also add, let me point out here that the last opportunity for the state, for the US empire to stop this situation was with Barack Obama. October 31st, 2008, the Bitcoin white paper was published. Mm -hmm. A week later, Obama was elected on hope and change. The financial system around us was collapsing. It was on the verge of absolute collapse. The population of America said, yes, we're electing Obama, an amazing orator. He said he gave them so much hope that he would put an end to this crime wave, that he would stop this situation, that these bankers would be punished for obliterating the US economy. Well, then uh, January 3rd, 2009, Bitcoin was birthed into the world. Chancellor on brink of second bailout for bank. Obama took office two weeks later and he promptly ignored the people. The people were right. He should have done something. He should have arrested all those bankers. He should have like um, t uh, kicked all the CEOs out. They all like were failed banks. The, the taxpayer of America bailed them out. They all should have lost their job. None of them did. That was the opportunity to do something. Mm. He chose instead to maintain the status quo, let uh, Larry Summers people rip across America with more of this um, ex excuses for fraud. So they compounded the fraud and that fraud is now like, talk about parabolic. Look at the amount of fraud that has been piled upon this global financial system since 2008. Uh, look at the balance sheets of the central banks around the world. Bitcoin is like a little tiny blip, the price, the, the, you know, the asset class as itself compared to the enormity of this fraud. But Barack Obama had that opportunity at that moment and he failed it. He, he chickened out. He decided to go with the people who um, destroyed the system. Yeah, I'd say that was the last chance. Yep. And do you think that happens because, you know, we're just near term thinkers? You know, you're put in that situation. Maybe he saw what could be the right thing to do as, as the way you've described it, Stacey. And he, he went the other direction because he was worried about, you know, having to be reelected in, in only four years, which isn't that much time. You know, what do you think drives that thinking? The same thinking that drove a lot of central bankers, like well, Jerome Powell, to pivot from being incredibly hawkish to unrolling the exact plan he said he would never unroll. What well, past curious? performance is no guarantee of future performance, right? So yeah. he was a heterodox, he was not a heterodox thinker. He was an orthodox thinker. And Larry Summers is the smartest guy in the room. Larry Summers worked with Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton served for two terms. So he's just, he's a mediocre thinker, an amazing orator. And that was what people confused. They, because he was such a great speaker, people thought he must be smart as well. And like, right. he must be <clears throat> inspirational and revolutionary. He wasn't a revolutionary. He was an orthodox thinker. And that's like, he thought because he went to Columbia and then he went to Harvard and he was Harvard law that all his friends from Harvard are also smart like I am. And they, it's a hubris and smugness. And that's what, you know, a lot of people around the King of France and Marie Antoinette are thinking like, 
you know, you're appointed by God. You're divine. Like, yeah. nothing's going to happen to us. Well, it's a, there's a history to this. You know, in the 70s, New York threw the keys over to uh, the banks, Felix Lazard, Felix uh, Lazard Frere. And, um, and then in the 80s, you had the, um, they threw the, um, the keys uh, over to uh, Wall Street. Uh, Reagan threw it to Michael Deaver, who was an ex-Merrill uh, Lynch guy. And then we saw the Clintons through the keys to Robert Rubin and Larry Summers and Alan Greenspan. And they brought in wave after wave of deregulation. Uh, they got rid of Glass-Steagall. They brought in the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. They opened up China to world trade. Right. And uh, every single time, every single one of those guys got fabulously wealthy on every single one of those acts. Then Obama comes around and uh, they threw the keys to Larry Summers and Larry Summers uh, got fabulously wealthy again and his friends. And they did the same thing all over again. They deregulated they um, even more. Uh, and uh, so this is true uh, uh, throughout going on, you know, back to the Reagan period. You know, we had Paul Volcker in this in the late 70s was the last central banker that understood the role of the central bank. Alan Greenspan completely rewrote the mandate of the central bank as being um, the Greenspan put era, where he said, you know, it's not our job to try to take the punch bowl away when the party gets too raucous. We're simply here to mop things up after the crashes. That's what he, he said many times. And also in retirement, he has recanted and said, actually, I was completely wrong in my entire ideology about central banking, and I apologize. He said that when he left office. Uh, but uh, Jerome Powell was never uh, hawkish. He, uh, from day one, was a dove. And uh, Janet Yellen is the dove. And Ben Bernanke is a dove. And uh, if you cannot get that job unless you are a dove, nobody, this is, so what, what could what could derail Bitcoin, uh, you know, would be suddenly uh, there is um, enforcement of the law, <laughs> you know, suddenly people start enfo enforcing laws, right? That, and I think the probability, again, of that is zero because an economy that is, the business model is fraud, that you can't, you can't take that away, right? So the business model of, of JP Morgan is they keep 90 cents of every dollar they steal, right? So they pay 10 cents in a fine. You know, they just paid a billion dollar fine for manipulating the gold price. How did right. they pay for that fine? By manipulating the gold price, right? right. So there's no law enforcement. Uh, Eric Holder said, we can't enforce law on Wall Street because it's national security. So if you're on Wall Street and the attorney general just gave you a green light to commit fraud, you to stay competitive, you need to commit fraud. So the, if you're virtuous, you're going to be out of business in a New York minute, right? Mm -hmm. You're done. You're toast. And so I don't think that, and not, it's not going to change anytime soon. That, that, I mean, that's that's not going to change. You know, it's uh, it's not going to change. It's just not the, the going thing, to change. The thing about a racket, <clears throat> if you think of like the mafia in New York, is that you've all committed a crime, so you can't ever go straight, like because right. you're you you leave all the others vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. So they right. all mm. stay in the racket. I mm. mean, it might not be like breaking kneecaps. But it's it's impoverishing and deindustrializing America. You know that's that's the racket. That's what they had to do to maintain this fraudulent system. Right, and uh, their whole processes are linear, and, and Bitcoin is expanding exponentially. So they're they they're going to a, a gunfight with a knife. Right, every single like coming out with a central bank digital currency. That's a rear guard action. That's too little, too late. Okay. It's just reinventing fiat money and means nothing to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is separate state from money. A digital uh, uh, central bank digital currency is just another form of a centrally planned currency. It's no different than what they currently have now, which is 98% digital to begin with. So they're, 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 they're bureaucrats and they, and they are corrupt. And it's like the old Soviet Union. America's become the Soviet Union circa 1955, essentially, uh, yeah. by throwing, by, they have a Politburo called the uh, Federal Open Market Committee. They uh, 
control the price of money by price fixing and price controls. They've abandoned the free market orthodoxy in America, and the result is predictable. The economy is collapsing. The wealth and income gap is skyrocketing, and there's social unrest everywhere. People are invading the Capitol building and stealing the speaker's podium un, 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 unabated. Un, 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 you know, so <laughs> that's not a functioning democracy. That's not a functioning country. So people, why would you own dollars? In a, uh, it's like, I'm going to buy... Uh, I'm going to buy a seat on the Titanic after it hits the iceberg. Nobody does that, right? It's like, why would you buy dollars? We hit the iceberg and we're sinking. Well, what kind of moron would do that? Oh, by the way, there's a lifeboat called Bitcoin. And there's only one. And you've got a bunch of billionaires on the Titanic. And how much is that lifeboat price going to move up? <laughs> in the five minutes it takes before you sink and die i'm i'm i'm, I'm gonna tell you the price is gonna go up a lot fast so here you got the bitcoin lifeboat you've got a lot of billionaires out there with a fiat money burning sack of shit and they're like how the hell do i get off this boat and they're like oh there it is i'm going oh I, it's gonna go every penny i own i'll do it right, right. that's what's happening right now if you don't so would you want to go down with a ship no i don't think so you seem like a smart guy <laughs> okay i gotta i'm gonna cap it at that that was that was a fantastic conclusion i have used up my time look I, I appreciate you guys spending the time to like i said i came at this with uh, what i consider to be pretty juvenile understanding of, of of why you know and and i entered the bitcoin space initially as a speculator and then i started looking at it as a my safe haven asset class and i just i dollar cost average in every couple of weeks throw some cash that direction for the last year i mean i wasn't early it was a year ago that i started taking a serious look at this stuff um I mean, it's a, an asset that I don't trade. I just park it, set it, forget it. And, you know, ideally that, that pans out for me. And, and um, you help provide some clarity on why that's, uh, why I'm doing the right thing. So I appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for your time, both of you. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Thanks.